ومن سلك طريقا يلتمس فيه علما سهل الله له به طريقا إلى الجنة طيب إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شر أنفسنا ومن سيئة أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد So this is the first uh, uh, lecture of the day Hopefully inshallah we'll be having four lectures uh, This being the first one So the first lecture is an introduction into the manhaj of the salaf or the salafi manhaj what it means and the names different names of Ahlul Sunnah and so on so, and that we'll get into in a few minutes the second lecture is on the stance of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah or their position towards the people of Bid'ah so once you've understood the Salafi methodology you learn the opposite to it which is how the Salaf Rahmatullahi Alayhi Majma'een would distance themselves and stay away from the people of innovation and how they would refute them. The third lecture is on maintaining the legislative balance in the Salafi Manhaj in which we'll talk about two diseases that are found in the Salafi ranks. The first being extremism and the second being the opposite to that which is watering down the pure Salafi methodology. And then the fourth lecture will be on common misconceptions or doubts surrounding the Salafi methodology that people use in order to uh, demean or in order to uh, take credit away from the Salafi methodology and in order to make it like all of the other groups and parties and organizations. So that is an overview of the day. First and foremost, or secondly, I'm going to go into the Ahdaf of the Dora, the reason why the Dora has been put together and the reasons why these titles have been chosen. Like with anything in life, there has to be a reason behind it. You can't just do something randomly just for the sake of doing it. So the very first reason or hadaf or the objectives of the objective of this dawah is at-ta'rifu bil manhaj as-salafi wa ahm usulihi. Clarifying or presenting and giving a clarification on the correct or on the salafi methodology, what it means. And mentioning the most important or some of the most important foundations of this uh, noble methodology. The second is Bayan Ahmiyat Tiba al Manaj al Salafi, Wahukum al Intisabi ilayhi. The second is clarifying and mentioning the importance of following the Salafi methodology and the ruling on affiliating yourself to the Salafi. Methodology and saying I am a Salafi Is it permissible? Is it not permissible? Did anyone from the Salaf use it? And so on The third is Bayanu mawqif salaf Min ahl al-bid'a Wa mujalasatihim wa tahdhir minhum Clarifying the stance of ahl al-sunnati wal jama'ah Of the Salaf With regards to the people of innovation Sitting with them and warning against them The fourth objective or the hadaf is Idharu wa satiyati al-manhaj al-salafi Bayna sara'i Clarifying the middle position of the Salaf methodology and how it's different to all of the other deviant groups, sects, and ideologies. Number five, Al Ijaba to Ambad Shubuhati Hawl Manhaj Salafi with Dawati Umuman. A answering some of the most uh, prominent misconceptions or doubts raised with regards to the Salafi methodology and the da'wah in general. Number six, Bayan Fadl Ulama is Sunnah, wa Adami Jawazi is Qatihim wa Ta'ani Fihim. Clarifying the virtue of the scholars of Ahl Ilm, or the scholars of the Salaf, and the scholars of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'a, whether it's those that have passed or whether it's those that are the contemporary scholars. And respecting them and honoring them and not dropping them. 
uh, due to desires and so on. Number seven, atamizu bain da'wat salafiyya wa ghayriha. Number seven is to know the distinguishing facts between or factors between the Salafi methodology and other groups and other than the Salafi methodology. And number eight, ma'rifatu al-farqi bain al-manhaji wal aqidah Knowing the difference between the manhaj and the aqidah. So these are the ahadaf. Now that you've written them down, inshallah after the dawah, you can use it as a checklist. So these are the things that you should know by the end of the dawah, inshallah. And if you don't know, then inshallah, hopefully in the question and answer session, you can get more clarification. The first lecture <coughs> is entitled Kun Salafiyan Al Jadda. And it means be a Salafi, an upright, steadfast Salafi. Be an upright, steadfast Salafi. And I've divided it into about six different parts. The first is Al Mabhath Al Awal Wujubu Tamasuki Bil Kitabi Wa Sunnah. The obligation of holding on to the Kitab and the Sunnah. Al Mabhath Al Thani Al Maqsud Bil Salaf Wa Tarifu Bil Manhaj Al Salafi Wa Ahmiya Tu Wujub Ittiba Al Manhaj Al Salafi. The second Mabhath that we'll be talking about is what is meant by Salaf and an introduction to the Salaf in methodology, what it means and the importance of following it and some of the statements of the scholars regarding it or that is the fourth Mabhath actually al mabhath al-thalith musammayatu ahl sunnah what are the names of ahl sunnah inshallah we'll study several different titles that the scholars name or the scholars give or the salaf gave for the people who follow the methodology of ahl sunnah al mabhath al-rabi' aqwalu aimmat salaf fi wujub tamassuk bil manhaj salaf statements from the salaf from the scholars that have proceeded in the golden generations in stressing the importance of following the Quran and the Sunnah upon the understanding of the Salaf al Salih. Al Mabhath al Khamis, Usulun wa Ma'alimu al Manhaj al Salafi, Usulu wa Ma'alimu al Manhaj al Salafi, foundations of the Salafi methodology and the monuments of the Salafi methodology. And Al Mabhath al Sadis is Masail Muhimma Muhimma Mulhaqatun Bil Mawdu'a. Important Masail that are also connected to the methodology of this, of this topic. I mean, important topics relating to the subjects of the lecture, such as, uh, as, you shall see, as, you, as you shall see at the end of the lecture, inshallah. So the first Mabhath is the obligation of holding on to. The Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi or the Kitab of Allah Jalla wa Ala and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. First and foremost, the Kitab is the Kitab that Allah Jalla wa Ala has sent. And the Sunnah is a revelation that Allah Jalla wa Ala has also sent. So the, the Quran is from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likewise. Allah jalla wa ala says, وَمَا يَنْتِقُوا عَنِ الْهَوَى إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَى Allah jalla wa ala mentions that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam doesn't talk from speak, uh, desires and whims. Rather what he speaks sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is revelation. So in these two, we find the legislation of the Muslim. Allah Jalla wa Ala says, وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ Allah Jalla wa Ala says that it is not befitting, it is not for a believing male or female that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger decree a certain matter and order a certain matter that they have any option in the matter. Also, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, تَرَكْتُ فِيكُمْ أَمْرَيْنِ لَنْ تَضِلُّ مَا تَمَسَّكْتُمْ بِهِ مَا كِتَابُ اللَّهِ وَسُنَّتِي I have left with you two things that if you hold on to, you will never be misguided. 
the Prophet وسلم, said, the Kitab of Allah, the Book of Allah Jalla wa'ala, the Quran, al kareem <coughs> and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when Sunnah is being mentioned here, when we're talking about the Sunnah here, it is referring to the complete methodology of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And more specifically, the belief of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the belief that Ahl Sunnah inherited from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's why the Salaf would say, or in their books, they would write, or the titles that they would give their books would be Sharh Sunnah, Usul Sunnah, Kitab Sunnah, and so on. So Sunnah in the books of Aqeedah and in our gathering today means the methodology of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his Aqeedah and in his ibadah and everything to do with the methodology of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that is important to know because when you hear of Sunnah and you're studying Usulul Fiqh, it is different to when you hear Sunnah and you're studying Hadith. Likewise, it is different to when you're studying Fiqh. So the word, usu, uh, the word Sunnah, the usage or the context or the meaning depends on the context that it is found. So in the books of Aqeedah, then it refers to the Aqeedah of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, that which is in contradiction to Al Bid'ah, innovations. That is which is in contradiction to innovations, Rahmatullahi alayhim. That's why Shaykh al Islam, Rahimahullah, he mentions, Wallafdu Sunnah, and the word in Sunnah, fi kalami salaf, with regards to the words of the salaf, Yatanawalu as Sunnah fil ibadat, in worship. وفي الاعتقادات اعتقادات and in belief as well وإن كان كثير من من صنف في في السنة يقصدون كلا الكلام في الاعتقادات although the majority of and many of those that have authored with regards to the sunnah they in reality are referring to the اعتقاد the belief of the Muslim the belief of the Muslim طيب now this leads us on to the next point which is is there a difference between the manhaj and al manhaj and al aqidah these are two words that are often found and they're used as a mutaradifani as words that are very similar al manhaj and al aqidah the scholars say there's a difference between the two and they're not the same the second thing is we need to know that difference. And the third thing that we need to know is the fact that they're different, does it mean that the manhaj of a person can be different to his aqidah? So first and foremost, manhaj relates to everything regarding the religion of the Muslim, which is what they believe in, what they, believe in, what they take as evidence, the methodology they follow with regards to ibadah, with regards to da'wah, when they're given da'wah, with regards to how they deal with the creation, with regards to the relationship between them and Allah Jalla wa'ala, and the relationship between them and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the manhaj of the Muslim is the methodology of the manhaj of the Muslim. So that is general. Then we have aqidah which is specific to that which the Muslim believes in. That which the Muslim believes in. For example, the existence of Allah Jalla wa'ala, al-Iman billahi subhanahu wa ta'ala, believe in Allah Jalla wa'ala, al-Iman in the angels, in the Qadr of Allah, in the, in, in the prophets, in the books of Allah Jalla wa'ala, and so on, and the last day. Also to believe that the, uh, the believers will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, 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 in Jannah. And every other aspect of the aqeedah of the Muslim, that which he believes in. So that is the aqeedah of the Muslim. Like you study in the books of Tawheed and the books of Usul al-Sunnah and so on. So that is the difference between the two. And manhaj is more general. Aqeedah is a part of one's manhaj. The third point is, can a person say, my aqeedah is salafiyya, my belief is salafi, 
However, my manhaj is, for example, ikhwani, a ikhwani or a tablighi methodology or from any of the other deviant sects. The answer is no. For a person's manhaj to be correct, it will automatically make the aqidah correct. And for one's aqidah to be correct, it will necessitate that their manhaj is correct. So for example, the Muslim believes in the aqidah that it is permissible, for example, to rebel against the hukam. That's with regards to the aqidah of the Muslim. If we look at the manhaj aspect of that, where do we get the evidence from to know that it is not permissible to rebel against the hukam? We get it from the general manhaj of the Muslim. Your istidlal, the way you use evidence and what evidence you take from the Quran and the Sunnah, that is your manhaj. So there's that connection between the two. Al Mabhat al Thani, the second Mabhat or the second part of the lecture is Al Maqsud bi Salaf. What is meant by the Salaf and the Salafi methodology? First and foremost, the word Salaf is something that has preceded. Something that has preceded. Qala Jalla wa Ala Fajalnahum Salaf wa Mathan lil Akhirin. Fajalnahum Salaf wa Mathan lil Akhirin. When Allah Jalla wa Ala was talking about Fir'aun in Surah Al Zukhruf. So they are something that has preceded and an example and an ibrah to those that will come after them. Like when the word as-salaf, as-salih is being mentioned, then it means righteous predecessors. Those that preceded us in goodness. So when the word as-salaf, as-salih is mentioned, and at times you will hear as-salaf, which literally means the Salaf al-Salih as well. It's just uh, short for Salaf al-Salih. It means the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or who are they? The companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the tabi'oon, those that followed them, their students, wa atba'u tabi'een, and those that followed the companions' students. And they are the first three generations of this ummah in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam praised. And he said about them, خَيْرُ النَّاسِ قَرْنِي ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ The best of the people are uh, my generation, then the ones after them, and then those that come after them. And then those that come after them. So the meaning of the Salafi methodology, or the meaning of As-Salaf salih are those that came after the, the companions, or the companions, and those that came after them, and those that came after them. And they are the ones that the Prophet sallallahu praised. And they are the ones that the Prophet sallallahu praised. So now that you know who is being referred to when as salafu salih are being mentioned, who is being referred to, now you need to know who are what, what is their methodology? What is their methodology? Their methodology is makana alayhi sahaba wa tabi'un wa atba'u tabi'een. وَهُوَ فَهْمُ الْقُرْآنِ وَالسُنَّةِ عَلَى فَهْمِهِمْ So the Salafi methodology is to understand the Qur'an and the Sunnah according to the understanding of the companions, the tabi'oon, the followers of the companions and the followers of the followers of the companions. And in summary, as-salaf, as-salih. To understand the Quran and the Sunnah, how they understood it. How they understood it. So when a person is saying a sel- the Salafi methodology, you're literally saying that I am following a methodology that has not been introduced into this Ummah. It is a methodology that remained, that was existent during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that all of the companions were upon and all of the imams of the of the salaf were upon the students of the companions and those that followed them and also it's important to know that when the salaf have been mentioned we're not talking about those that were ahlul bid'a people of innovation during that time because there were a lot of people that were 
upon misguidance during their time, the Khawarij, the Qadariya, the Mu'tazila, the Asha'ira, and so on and so forth. So these deviant groups, and the Rawafid and the Shia, these groups were around during the time of the Salaf, Lakin when Salaf of Salih has been mentioned, they are not being referred to. Because they're only Salaf Lughatan, yani yes, they have preceded, Lakin they're not Salihin. They're not the Salaf of Salih. They're not the righteous people who held on to the Quran and the Sunnah exactly how the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam held on to. The next mas'ala is, we say obviously that we hold on to the Quran and the Sunnah upon the Salaf, upon the understanding of the Salaf. We hold on to the Quran and the Sunnah upon the what? The understanding of the Sahaba or the understanding of the Salaf. Why is it important to add this? It's important to add this for various reasons. Number one, this is the core difference between every single deviant sect and the Salaf or the Salafiyun or Ahlul Sunnah. Every group from the deviants will say to you that they follow the Quran and the Sunnah in most cases. And at the very least, they will say they follow the Quran. And they will leave some evidence in from the Sunnah. Like in, in general, they will say they follow the Quran and the Sunnah. But one thing that they can't say is they follow the Quran and the Sunnah Ala Fahmi Salaf upon the understanding of the Salaf. The reason is because with the Quran they can interpret it according to their desires and their understanding and their deviant interpretations. To the extent that they can actually say, let's change the harakat, the uh, the, the, the led the pronunciation of the words. And the harakat, the harakat that you would put at the end of the letters. So that it can suit their methodology. So they will say, وَكَلَّمَ اللَّهَ مُوسَى تَكْلِيمًا For example, they will say that Allah, uh, Musa spoke to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So with the Qur'an they will change. Again with the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa they will say we're going to take some parts and we're not going to take some parts. For example, the Ahad that have single narrations or a limited number of narrations, chains of narrations, they'll say we won't take that in Aqeedah. Lakin, one thing they cannot say is we're upon the Aqeedah of the Salaf al Salih. Because all you need to say to them is, Tayyip, give me the evidence where Abu Bakr said this, or where Umar said this, or where Ali, where Uthman, where Abdullah ibn Abbas, or Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Give me the evidence where they said this. Where's their interpretation of this verse? Also the Salaf, when it comes to Imam Ahmed, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi and so on, the Salaf in general, you say to them, give me their statements that support your interpretation of this attribute of Allah. Give your evidence to support your understanding. This is one thing that they can't do. So that's the first reason why we say the Quran and the Sunnah upon the Salaf of Salih, upon the understanding of the Sahaba. The second reason is that the Sahaba, Ridwanullah Ta'ala alayhim, they witnessed the revelation of the Qur'an coming down upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they knew the reason why the verses were revealed. They knew the context. Sometimes it was with regards to them that the Qur'an was revealed. Sometimes the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said a certain hadith because of them, because of a specific individual. So the second reason we say that we follow the Qur'an and the Sunnah upon the understanding of the Sahaba and the Salaf is that they witnessed the revelation coming down upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they knew the context of the verses that were being revealed upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which means their interpretation is going to be correct which means their interpretation is going to be correct If I give you an example, something that you can all comprehend. If there's a leak in the corner of this room, if there's a leak in the corner, and someone gets a, a massive tray or bucket, 
and leaves the bucket in the corner. And the water drips and drips and drips. And then it dries up. Every person in this room will realize why the bucket was put in. Sah? Why was it put in? Because of the leak coming down. However, if someone comes in an hour later and the roof is dry or the ceiling is dry, they might think, why was the bucket put there? Right? Will they know exactly why the bucket was put there? No. So their understanding of why the bucket is there, will it be the same as your understanding of why the bucket is there? Why? Because they weren't present. But you, you're present, you see it. Therefore, you saw the lesson got stopped, the teacher stopped talking, and we had to wait for someone to get a bucket, put it in the corner, and then you heard the dripping of the water in there. So you actually witnessed it. Hence, the Sahaba, عليهم, they knew the revelation behind, or the reasons behind the revelation of the verses of Allah. Subhanahu and the ones that they did not know, the Prophet وسلم, explained it to them. Hence, later on, when things did happen, and new scenarios would arise, hawadith or nawazil, new things would happen, they would be able to give a fatwa. Why would they be able to give a fatwa? Because they will have evidence from the Qur'an and the Sunnah. And even if they didn't have evidence from the Qur'an and the Sunnah, they would have enough knowledge to give them the tools of making the correct, or giving the correct ruling. For example, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he was given the fatwa on a woman who, whose husband died, who hasn't been specified a, a, a mahr, and the inheritance. So he said, yes, there's upon idda, there's a waiting period on her. She has to also get inheritance, and she gets the mahr of those people that are in yani the norm, in the community. He didn't know that there was a hadith stating that. Like in he gave a fatwa based on what he learned from the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then what happened? Someone came to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and he said to him, Verily I heard the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam judge exactly like you've judged. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud got so happy and he was obviously happy and overwhelmed at the fact that his ijtihad was the same as the ijtihad of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that is the second reason. The third reason is that the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were united in their usul, in their foundations, in their aqidah. It was one and the same. Their aqidah was one and the same. They did not differ in the aqidah that they had. And their evidence in what they knew, what they used as evidence, the hadith of the Prophet, the Quran of Allah and the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was exactly the same. So they did not differ in aqidah. They did not differ in aqidah. Whereas if you look into the later generations, a deviant group within themselves have about 100 different beliefs. The khawarij, they would split into 30 or 40 different groups. The mu'tazila and so on. So on. The ashaira, they would split into so many different groups. Because every one of them is going back to his what? Intellect and logic. Whereas the Sahaba, they would go back to the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Therefore, they would not differ. Because the Qur'an and the Sunnah don't differ. The revelation stopped. The Qur'an stopped. It was completed. Allah says, Allah has completed the religion for us. Therefore, their evidence would be exactly the same. Where they derived their evidences from. The fourth point is, that the Sahaba, there was not a single companion of the Prophet وسلم, that innovated in the religion of Allah Jalla wa'ala. Rather, they refuted the people of desires. There was not a single companion that innovated and diverted from the Sunnah of the Prophet. That's why when Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Abdullah ibn Abbas, عنه, when, he, when Ali sent him to debate the Khawarij, those that rebelled against Ali, when he sent them, when Abdullah ibn Abbas was sent to bring them back, one of the strongest proofs that Abdullah ibn Abbas said to them at the beginning was, verily, I've come from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's companions. I've come from the Prophet's camp, his companions. وَلَيْسَ فِيكُمْ مِنْهُمْ أَحَدٍ 
and there is not one of them, one of who? The companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there is not one of them among you. So note how Abdullah ibn Abbas, he used the lack of existence in the camp uh, in the, with the Sahaba or the Khawarij, the fact that there was no one from the Sahaba among them, he used that as an evidence to show that they were upon what? Truthhood or falsehood? Falsehood. Because if there was any truth to what you're saying, you would have at least had a, had a companion. So that is one of the reasons or the fourth reason. The fifth reason is that the sunnah is Islam and Islam is the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they are one and the same. They inter one another. That's why the Salaf would say, Rahmatullah alayhim, I'lam anna al-Islam huwa sunnah, wa alam anna sunnata hiya al-Islam. Know that the correct Islam is that which is in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That which is in accordance with the correct teachings of Islam. So as a Muslim, you don't say that my first source of reference that I take my evidence is the Qur'an. لا, at the same time, as Imam al-Bani said, you say the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Because there are rulings found in the, Quran, in the Sunnah that are not found in the Qur'an. And the in Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam interprets and explains and restricts the Qur'an. Or the, the verses that are mentioned in the Qur'an or some verses that are mentioned in the Qur'an. The Sunnah explains it. For example, you won't know how to pray the five daily prayers if you don't look into the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You won't find that Zuhr is four rak'at, Fajr is two, Maghrib is three. You won't find that in the Quran. That's why the Sunnah and Islam are one thing. And anyone that opposes the Sunnah leaves the fold of the Sunnah. And anyone that leaves opposes Al Islam in general and falls into shirk and kufr, they leave Islam in totality. They leave Islam in totality. So these are the reasons why we say we follow the Quran and the Sunnah ala fahmi salaf al upon the understanding of the Salaf al-Salih. And I say that because sometimes people will say, the Qur'an and Sunnah are enough for us, akhi. Why are you holding on to other things? And we say, la. The Qur'an and the Sunnah, upon the understanding of the Salaf, is enough for us. Tayy. The next point is, who is a Salafi? Man who is Salafi? The Salafi is, man amana wa tamassaka bima dalla alayhi al-Qur'an wa Sunnah the Salafi is the one that believes in, that acts upon, and holds on to that which the Quran, or holds on to the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam upon the understanding of the Sahaba. Upon the understanding of the Sahaba. Naam. A person who believes in, holds on to, acts upon the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, upon the understanding of the companions and the three golden generations, or upon the understanding of the three golden generations, the Salaf al-Salih, or in other words, the companions, their followers and the followers of the followers of the companion students. That is who the Salaf is. The Salaf doesn't have to go to a certain location, a certain country, a certain masjid. He doesn't have to give a certain allegiance, bay'ah. He doesn't have to align himself with a group of people to be a Salaf. As long as inwardly and outwardly you believe in these three things, the Quran and Sunnah with the understanding of Salaf, then you are a Salafi. The next mas'ala is, is it permissible to say that you are a Salafi? Is it permissible to say that you are a Salafi? This, uh, we've said that the Salaf, the Salih, are those that have preceded. And the Ya is Ya al Nisbabas. It is the Ya to show that you're affiliating yourself with them. So, a, uh, uh, for example, you say, I'm a Salafi, or this person is a Salafi. So is it permissible to say this or not? Let's look into the words of those scholars that have preceded us in goodness. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he says, Rahmatullah alayhi, 
لا عيب على من أظهر مذهب السلف وانتسب إليه واعتز إليه بل يجب قبول ذلك منه بالاتفاق فإن مذهب السلف لا يكون إلا حقا He says رحمة الله عليه ورضي الله عنه He says There is no blame upon the one who ascribes himself and holds on to the methodology of the salaf rather it is wajib compulsory to accept that from him بالاتفاق by way of consensus meaning there's no khilaf among the salaf in this why is that فان مذهب السلف because the methodology of the salaf لا يكون الحق it is not anything but the truth it only consists of the truth so here we have Shaykh al-Islam He's saying that it is permissible اتفاق, And it, rather it is wajib to accept it from him Secondly Imam al-Dhahabi rahimahullah In his book of Seer al al Where he talks about the biographies of those great people The scholars that have preceded Many of them he would praise them For being a Salafi Many of them he would praise them For being a Salafi So he would say for example about Imam al-Tariqudni rahimahullah وكان سلفيا مجانبا لعلم الكلام. He was a Salafi who used to stay away from those the philosophy and the rhetoric, and rhetoric and so on. Those people that are from the people of kalam that rely upon their intellect, that rely upon philosophy and logic to give or to have their belief. So he says كان سلفيا he was a Salafi. He also says رحمه الله فالذي يحتاج إليه الحافظ that which the Hafid, the Imam, the one that is upon the Sunnah, that has memorized the Hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that which he needs is أن يكون تقياً ذكياً تقياً ذكياً سلفياً He has to be a تقي, a God-fearing person. He has to be an intelligent person and he has to be a Salafi. And he has to be a Salafi. طيب. So there's no harm if a person says, I'm a Salafi. Again, this doesn't mean you can't don't go to two extremes. You can't start to now take a microphone and go to everyone and say, What well, are you Salafi or not? Are you Salafi or not? Okay? But you can't go to the other extreme and say that yeah, well, let's just say we're Muslims, Allah named us Muslims and say we're upon the Quran and the Sunnah, but don't say Salafi because people are gonna think you're a group and so on and so forth. It doesn't matter what people think, the re- think the reality is of the reality of the haqiq of the reality or the matter is that it is not a sect. By you saying, I'm a, I'm a Salafi, it is you saying, I upon, I'm upon the Quran and the Sunnah upon the understanding of the Salaf. And a man actually came to Imam Al-Bani, rahimahullah, and he said, why don't we just call ourselves Muslims? Then Imam Al-Bani said to him, Daib, what are you, a Shi'i or a Sunni? He goes, I'm a Sunni. I'm a Sunni. He goes, Daib. Well, the Sunni... So now you've said, why don't you say you're Muslim? You're saying you're Sunni. طيب, come down to the second level. Everyone says they're Sunni. Like, you know, what sort of Sunnah are you upon? So the individual said, طيب, they're what the companions were upon. Then Imam al-Bani rahimahullah said to him, طيب, instead of saying oh, I'm a Muslim, a Sunni, upon the understanding of the Sahaba, just say I'm a Salafi. It's a shortcut. And it means exactly the same thing. It means... Exactly the same thing And you're not affiliating yourself To a certain group That is in a certain location So you have people that go Of the two extremes طيب المبحث الثالث The third مبحث Is the names of أهل السنة والجماعة And أهل السنة والجماعة They have different names لكن Number one Their names may be different لكن the thing that they point towards Are the same The, name may be di- the names might be different In wording like in, in the word, in the meaning, they are calling to exactly the same thing. Secondly, why did these names come about? These names, the scholars mentioned that these names come about because they were deviants that appeared into the ummah that would all claim to be upon the truth, like in they would oppose the correct teachings of the Sharia. Therefore, the Salaf, rahmatullahi alayhim. They would make up, they would bring names that would differentiate them from the people of innovations. However, these names would not come out of their pockets. These names were also derived from the Quran and the Sunnah. These names were also derived from the Quran and the Sunnah. So the first name 
or the, 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 the title that these people carry are Ahlu Sunnati Wal Jama'ah. Ahlu, the people, a Sunnah of the Sunnah Wal Jama'ah and the Jama'ah, the main body of the Muslims. What does this mean? First and foremost, The Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, you've already understood the beginning part of the lesson we talked about what the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, was. That which he وسلم, did, said, agreed with in terms of belief, in terms of its attributes, everything of the Prophet وسلم, and more specifically so, the Aqeed of Ahlul Sunnah which is in contradiction to Al Bid'ah. So that is Sunnah. So they are the people that follow the Sunnah of the Prophet. Wal Jama'ah. They are the people that cling on to the main body of the Muslims. And who does that take away? The Khawarij. Those people who rebelled against the main body of the Muslims. So for example, during the time of the companions, Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah, if we were going to say, they would be the companions. Ali and the companions that were with him. Why? Because they are on the Sunnah and they are with the Jama'ah, the main body of the Muslims. Whereas those Khawarij who fought against the companions, they left the main body of the what? Of the Muslims. And in return, as an effect of that, they left the sunnah of the Prophet So that is why they are called Ahlul Sunnati Wal Jama'ah. And they will be called Ahlul Sunnati Wal Jama'ah for as long as they follow the sunnah and the Jama'ah, the main body of the Muslims. And they don't come with anything that takes them out. The next name is Ahlul Hadith. Ahlul Hadith Ahlul Hadith meaning the people of the Hadith The people that hold on to the Ahadith And act upon the Ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam The reason why this came about Is because there were those that were Ahlul Ra'yi the people of the opinion or the intellect that relied on their qiyas, their analogy. And they would contradict these ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So these people would rely on the opinions of men and their suggestions and their beliefs as to the ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So what did Ahlul Sunnah do? They acted upon the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, Hence they would be called Ahlul Hadith The people that act upon the hadith of the Prophet That's why some of the Salaf would say Laysa fi dunya mubtadi'un illa wa huwa yubghadu ahl hadith There is not a mubtadi' Imam Ahmed ibn Sinan al-Qattan He said There is not a mubtadi' in the dunya Except that he hates the people of Ahlul Hadith Meaning those people that hold on to the hadith of the Prophet the next is a salafiyun And we've already said a salafi The meaning behind a salafi And salafiyun is just the plural to that A salafiyun So the salaf Were those people that obviously preceded And the salafiyun are those That are upon their methodology That are treading their methodology In belief In manhaj In everything And the word salaf is not new It was used by the salaf so for example, Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah, he would have in one of his chapter titles or headings, Babu Makana Salafu Yadakhiruna fi Buyutihim wa Asfarihim min al-Ta'ami wa Lahmi wa Ghayri. Wal Muradu bi Salaf there with the Sahaba. The meaning behind that is the Sahaba. So he would say, Bab, the chapter of that which the Salaf would store with regards to their uh, in their homes and in their traveling from ta'am and food and so on. And if I remember correctly, that is relating to Eid Ayamu Tashriq. In which the Udhiyya is done. Also, Abdullah ibn Mubarak rahmatullah alayhi, he said in refuting one of the people of desires, he said, Da'u hadith Amr ibn Thabit. Leave the hadith, don't narrate from Amr ibn Thabit. Why is that? فَإِنَّهُ كَانَ يَصُبُّ salaf Because he used to insult the salaf. He used to insult the salaf. So the word salaf was something that was used in the books of According to the Salaf, Abdullah ibn Mubarak radiallahu anhu rahimahullah, he died 181. And Imam Bukhari, you know, that he was from the Salaf. And then even through the generations, 
they would use that as Imam Dhahabi uses in his uh, in his book of uh, Tariq history to point out that this person was Salafi and that person was a Salafi. The third is Ahlul Athar. Ahlul Athar. And this is similar to Ahlul Hadith. This is similar to Ahlul Hadith. Before we go into Ahlul Athar, Ahlul Hadith, there are two meanings for it. In terms of Ahlul Hadith, meaning those people that are upon the Haqq, but there's another specific usage which is not meant here, which is those that specialize in the knowledge of hadith. And we studied that at the beginning of Agbirin and Nawi. Those that specialize, the muhaddithun, those that specialize in the change of narrations, what is sahih, what is not, what is authentic, what isn't authentic. That is not what is meant here. Ahlul hadith that is meant is in terms of aqidah. Ahlul athar, they are those, the people of the narrations. That's what it literally means. That's the fourth name. And that literally means they hold on to the narrations of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they leave off the opinions of people and the opinions of those that oppose the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's why Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu he said, La yazalu nasu ala tariqi al athar. People will not cease to be upon the correct methodology for as long as they hold on to the narrations of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Also, Imam Abu Hatim, and they said in the, the Aqidah the Raziyah and Abu Zur and Abu Hatim, they said, Alamut al hadithi al waqi'atu fi al athar. A sign of the people of innovation is that they insult and they degrade and they belittle the people of the Athar that hold on to the narrations of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Number five, Al-Firqatul Najiyya, the saved sect. And where is this derived from? The hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he said that the Jews split into 71, the Christians 72, and this Ummah will split into 73, all of them in the fight except for one. All of them in the fight except for one. That means that that one is what? The saved sect, saved from what? Deviance in the dunya and saved from the fire in the hereafter. So they are Al-Firqatul Najiyya, the saved sect. Tayyip. And then we have Al-Ta'ifatul Mansura, the, sub, the aided or the sect, the group that will be aided until the yom, until yom Al-Qiyamah. The Prophet Sallallahu said, لا تزال طائفة من أمتي منصورين ظاهرين على الحق لا يضوهم من خذلهم ولا من خالفهم حتى يأتي أمر الله وهم على ذلك. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that they will always cease to be a people upon the truth that are supported, aided by Allah Jalla wa'ala, that are apparent upon the truth, and those that oppose them and those that forsake them will not be able to harm them until the affair of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes, and they are and they are upon that. Naam. Tayyip. And then the ninth one is Al-Ghuraba. Al-Ghuraba, the strangers. And that is also derived from the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where he said, بَدَأَ الْإِسْلَامُ غَرِيبًا Islam started as something strange. وَسَيَعُودُ كَمَا بَدَأَ غَرِيبًا And it will return to how it was, which is غريب and strange. فَطُوبَى glad tidings لِلْغَرَبَى To the strangers. And that is applicable to this day and age. When a person says that this is from the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, people look at you like you're weird. Has the hijab not become something weird? A person practicing the religion of Allah that person has become somewhat a person who's a weirdo. So these are the غَرَبَى of today. They're known as strangers. And they are upon the Sunnah of the Prophet. Number four, or the Al Mabhatu Rabi, we're going to look at some statements from the Salaf commanding us to follow the Salaf. Statements from the Salaf, from the uh, golden generations, telling us to follow and the importance of following the Salafi methodology. Number one, Imam Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, the noble, knowledgeable companion, he said, Man kana mustannan falyastanna biman qad mat. Whoever is taken an example of a role model, let him take as a role model those that have passed away. فَإِنَّ الْحَيْلَ تُمْنْ عَلَيْهِ الْفِتْنَةِ For verily the one that is alive is always prone to fitten. He said, أُولَٰئِكَ أَصْحَابُ مُحَمَّدٍ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَمْ They are the companions of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. كَانُوا أَفْطَلَ هَذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ They were the best of this ummah. وَأَبَرَّهَا قُلُوبًا And the most God-fearing in terms of their hearts. وَأَعْمَقَهَا عِلْمًا And they had the most knowledge. وَأَقَلَّهَا تَكَلُّفًا And those that يعني, overdid themselves the, mo- the least. Because they naturally understood the Quran and the Sunnah with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam explaining it to them. اختارهم الله لصحبة النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم. Allah جل وعلا chose them to be the companions of His Prophet صلى الله وسلم عليه. ولإقامة دينه and to establish his deen. فعرف لهم فضلهم. So know, know their virtue. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud رضي الله عنه is telling us know their virtue, the virtue of the companions of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. 
what uh, the virtue of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. What tabi'uhum, what ala atharihim, and follow them in their traces, in their ways, in their methodology, in their belief, in their character, in everything. Follow them. Wasiratihim, and in their biography. فَإِنَّهُمْ عَلَى الْهُدَى الْمُسْتَقِيمِ For verily they are upon upright guidance. For verily they are upon upright guidance. Also Imam Al-Awza'i rahimahullah, he said, إِسْبِقْ نَفْسَكَ عَلَى السُنَّةِ Hold yourself patient to the sunnah. وَقِفْ حَيْثُ وَقَفَ الْقَوْمِ And stand where they stood. وَقُلْ بِمَا قَالُوا And say that which they said. وَكُفَّ أَمَّا كُفُّ عَنْهُ and stay away from and refrain from that which they refrained from. Wasluk sabila salafik salih. And take the methodology and tread upon the methodology of the salaf as salih. The righteous predecessors. So Imam al awzai rahimahullah, he's not only telling us to be patient, lakin he's saying, qif haythu waqaf al qawm. Do as they did. Have the stop at the boundaries that they stopped on. If they said something, then say it. If they believed in something, then believe in it. Don't say, yeah, but Sheikh Fulan said, this Sheikh said, and this said, and this person said, yeah, but uh, this Imam said, and so on and so forth. La. Did the Salaf do it? So anytime that your someone brings a new belief for you or something new, say, did the Salaf do it? Whether it's Anashid, whether it's uh, uh, doing films or um, uh, acting in order to give da'wah and so on and so forth. Best. Did the Salaf do it? Yes or no? If they did it, then Alhamdulillah. And if they did not do it, then follow these words. Waqif haythu waqaf al qawm. Just stand where they stood. You can't go wrong if you stand and if you do exactly that which they did. Waqul bima qalu and say that which they said. The Salaf al Salih, their methodology is clear. We as the latter generations, we don't need to bring anything new. That is what it means to be a muttabi, to be a follower of the Salaf al-Salih. As the saying goes, if it's not broken, don't what? Fix it. The methodology of the Salaf al-Salih is not broken. It is salih wa muslih li zaman wa makkah. It is applicable and you can apply it in every age, in every era. Just follow it exactly how it is. And you don't need to come up with new things and new methodologies. And the people are yearning for the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Like when you say that this day and age is not suitable, this is not suitable, we can't do this because they lived in a different time to us. That is all from the whispers of shaitan. The methodology of the salaf al-salih, they will say, قُلْ بِمَا قَالُوا Say that which they said, it's very easy. Yeah, and it's actually easier because you don't have to do anything. Just read their books and follow their methodology. خلاص. وكف عما كف عن. Also, Imam Ahmed said, رحمه الله, أصول السنة عندنا, the foundations of the Sunnah according to us, عندنا يعني أهل السنة, التمسك بما كان عليه أصحاب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. Holding on to that which they were upon. والاقتداء بهم and holding on to their methodology. Following them. Holding on to it and following their methodology. وَتَغْكُلْ بِدَعْ And leaving off innovations. So Imam Ahmad rahimahullah, he says three things. These three things are literally found in the statements of the two sta- two Imams that preceded. The companion, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and Imam al-Awza'i. He says, the foundations of the sunnah is that we follow, we hold on to, that we follow, hold on to, follow, and leave off the bid'ah. Also Imam Malik rahimahullah, he said, لا يصلح آخر هذه الأمة إلا بما أصلح أولها. That the latter part of this ummah, us, those that will come after us, will not be rectified except with that which rectified its earlier part. Who were the earlier generations? The Salaf al Salih. Whatever rectified them will also rectify them. And this is another distinguishing uh, reality between Ahlul Sunnah and every other deviant sect. Every deviant sect wants that which is jadeed, that which is new. And they're constantly figuring out new ways to attract the people. And to rectify the situation of the Muslims. Like in Ahlul Sunnah, they say, La, khalas. let's take the people to the old. Let's take the people to the olden days belief and their methodology. 
And I'm not talking about olden days in terms of worldly things. I'm not saying let's go to the stone ages whereby we don't drive cars and no airplanes. That's not what I mean. In terms of aqidah, then our success lies in following the methodology of the Prophet وسلم, and his companions. Like in every deviant sect will come up with new things in order to, and that's why they, that's where misguidance comes from. طيب. The fifth mabhath is some usul or some of the foundations of the Salafi methodology. Number one, mustawud talaqi. In the Ahlul Sunnah. Where do Ahlul Sunnah take the evidence in from? Where is the source that they derive their rulings and their legislation from? The answer is the Quran of Allah Jalla wa Ala, the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam upon the Salaf, the understanding of the Salaf al Salih. And you know what Salaf al Salih means by now. So that is where the Salafiyun or the Ahlu Sunnah derive their Sharia from. The Quran, the Sunnah and the Ijma' of the Salaf al-Ummah. That is what makes them different to every other deviant sect. Tayyip. Allah Jalla wa Ala says, فَإِنْ تَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فَغُدُّوهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولُ If you differ in something, then return it back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Do not take it back to your beliefs. There are things that are aqeedah and then there are things that are the sharia or the furu' of the sharia, the branches. When new things happen with regards to the worldly things, then you go to a fatwa and you look from the fiqh, the ijtihad and so on. Like with the aqeedah and the methodology of the Muslim, they derive it from the Quran and the Sunnah upon the understanding of the Salaf al-Salih. And that is why if you get a alim from Africa, a alim from the Western world, a alim from uh, the Middle East, a alim from the far part of the Amazon forest, and you ask each one of them to write the aqid of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, every single one of them will say exactly the same thing. Why is that? They don't have, a, it's not like they've never met. Like, what is one? What is united? The reference point, the intilaq, where they are taking their sourcing or their referencing from. Just the Quran and the Sunnah upon the understanding of the Salaf. And even look at the scholars. There were those that were from Khorasan. There were those that were from Iraq. There were those that were from Sham. There were those that were from uh, Spain, as we know it now. There were those that were from Morocco. Different parts of the world. Like in the Aqidah is one, because where they're taking the Aqidah is from the Quran and the Sunnah understanding of the Salaf. Number two, al hitimam bi tasheeh al Aqidah ilman wa amalan wa tahaliman. The second distinguishing fact, uh, foundation of Ahlul Sunnah Jama'ah is that they give importance to the Aqidah of the Muslim. Teaching the Aqidah of the Muslim, rectifying the Aqidah of the Muslim and spreading the correct Aqidah of the Muslim. Starting with the Tawheed of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and warning against shirk. And calling to the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and warning against al-bid'ah and innovations. And warning against sins in general. And you won't find a group or a people other than Ahlul Sunnah calling to the rectification of the Aqeedah. Every other group will say to you, it doesn't matter what we believe in, as long as we share the common title of Al-Islam, as long as they were Muslims, you believe that Allah exists and Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam existed, خلاص, it doesn't matter. Anything else we put it to one side. That is incorrect. Lakin, the person that Ahlul Sunnah, Ahlul Sunnah will say to you, like, let's rectify our aqidah first. So they won't say to you, they won't allow you to go do a tawaf around the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu They say, let's stop. That is shirk. Whereas other deviant sects will say, what? That khalas, it doesn't matter. You believe in that. You intend well. You mean good. Do your tawaf, but later on, let's have our tea. So it's okay for them. Like in the main thing for the Salafi, the Sunni, the person upon the methodology of Ahlul Sunni, he will say, La, first and foremost, stop your shirk. First and foremost, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Don't make dua to the grave. Don't call it tawassul. 
Don't celebrate the birthday of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Don't rebel against the hukam as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us. The make or break point for Ahlul Sunnah is the Aqeedah. And that is the only way that the Ummah can be united. Where do they get that from? The methodology of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When he came to Mecca, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they had many social problems. Were they not burying their daughters? Did they not have four different types of nikah or even more? Bala, they did. Did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, did they not indulge in the gibbah? Did they not take each other's wealth unjustly? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not say, guys, stop conning each other. Don't bury your daughters. Be okay. Alhamdulillah, let's all get along. Like, he started off with what? He started with what? Ya qawm, qulu la ilaha illallah tuflihu. Ya qawm, say la ilaha illallah and you'll be successful. Even salah, that is the second pillar of al-Islam, it was only legislated in the night of al-Isra' wal miraj which was around the 10th year of the prophethood of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that is something that distinguishes Ahlul Sunnah from other than them. And even look onto, look into the da'wah in general. It is Ahlul Sunnah that are calling to aqeed. As for everyone else, in one panel, you will find a diabandi. In another panel, you will find the person who is a person of the khawarij. In, another, in the same panel, you will find someone who you don't even know what they believe in. All of these. Why? Because they come together for the common good as they believe. As they believe, the common good. You say la ilaha illa taib, I say la ilaha illa too. Let's call upon call to Allah. <laughs> Let's call la ilaha illa la ilaha illa Allah. Taib. Number three, taqdeemu naqli ala al aqli. In the ta'agud. Ahl al sunnati wal jama'ah, if there's a contradiction between our desires and our intellect and our logic and our understanding, and the Quran of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam We give precedence to the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And the Quran of Allah Jalla wa ala. We give importance to the nusus, the textual evidences Over our desires That's why Allah Jalla wa ala says فَغُدُّوهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَغَسُولُ Allah did not say Take it back to your awatif, your beliefs, your whims and desires and so on And your emotions Allah says take it back to Allah Jalla wa ala And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Number four, Luzum al Jama'a. Luzum al Jama'ati was Sam'u wa Ta'a. Having those two things. Luzum al Jama'a, holding on to the Jama'a. Stay sticking to the main body of the Muslims. Hence, they are called Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'a. And also, as Sam'u wa Ta'a, which is written in every single Aqeedah of the Salaf. Every single book that talks about the Aqeedah of the Salaf, this Masala is written in. Which is to follow. The Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to stick to the main body of the Muslims and to not rebel against the Hukam due to the Prophet's Ahadith. Even before you say due to the harm that comes after rebelling, before you say that, you say first and foremost due to the Ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Due to the Ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And also to not divide our, the Ummah, not to name each other. Let's name ourselves Tabliqi and give ourselves six principles. Let's call ourselves Jama'at al-Ikhwan Muslimin and we've got our own methodology and our own bay'ah and so on and so forth. Let's call ourselves Hizb al We're going to call ourselves Muhajirun. We're going to call ourselves Boko Haram. We're going to call ourselves Shabab and so on and so forth. Like none of that. Like can you follow the Sunnah and you call yourself Ahlul Sunnah, the people of the Sunnah, Wal Jama'at, that stick to the main body of the Muslims. Taib. Also, إثبات أسماء الله سبحانه وتعالى وصفاته Affirming the beautiful names and attributes of Allah سبحانه وتعالى من غير تحريف ولا تعطيل ولا تكيف ولا تمثيل Without changing, distorting, negating, or likening, or giving a form to any of the beautiful names and attributes of Allah سبحانه وتعالى And that goes back to what? The aqeedah, in reality, that goes back to the second, the third point, the second point, which is the importance of rectifying the aqeedah of the Muslim. Like in, the scholars specify this in specifically because, or mention it specifically because there are so many deviant groups that oppose Ahlul Sunnah in this. Taib. Number six, al-ibtu'adu an al-bid'ah. Staying away from innovations. Wa-tahdiru an min ahl al-bid'ah. And warning against ahl al-bid'ah. Staying away from bid'ah. And the people of Bid'a. 
whether it's all types of jama'at, groups and parties and organizations, whether it's out in the open or secret organizations and secret societies, we stay away from all of that. Because the more you stay with them, the more you'll be misguided and deviated. Hence, look at how many young people your age joined these groups. And they ended up what? Blowing themselves up, thinking between you and Jannah is that belt. Khalas. Set it off. Your next stop is Jannah. Why do they believe that? Because from a young age, they were misguided. You had people telling them to do this and do that and do that. And inshallah, Jannah is waiting for you. And the sad thing is the people that are saying this are living in castles, driving massive beautiful cars, going on holidays to western countries, playing golf, horse riding, saying lines of poetry in their mukhayyamat, in their camps, sitting around the fire, while the Muslim children get washed up on the shores of uh, uh, Europe. That is why it's important to stay away from the people of Bid'ah and all types of Bid'ah. When Ahlul Sunnah say to you stay away from the innovations and the people of innovation, it's because it's in your best interest. How many people were misguided because of their mixing with the people of misguidance? And inshallah we shall see some of that in the coming lectures. طيب. Also number seven, Al-Jam'u Bayn Al-Nusus وَغَدُّ مَا تَشَابَهْ مِنْهَا إِلَى الْمُحْكَمْ uh, combining the evidence in and looking at the sharia as a whole enter into Islam in totality as a whole religion to not take one evidence and run with it and have an independent understanding to the rest of the sharia rather you follow the Quran and the Sunnah and anything that is not clear to you you return it back to that which is clear and we shall see examples inshallah in the next three lectures also number eight is أن التمكين في الأرض أن التمكين والتغيير في الأرض يكون برجوع إلى ما كان عليه سلف الأمة that the way that Muslims can attain authority and power and success in the dunya is if they return back to that which the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and the companions were upon Allah says إن الله لا يغير إن الله لا يغير ما بقوم حتى يغير ما بأنفسهم Allah جل وعلا says that Allah will not change a people until they return back to that which, until they rectify themselves. Until they rectify themselves. Also, Allah Jalla wa Ala says, وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَعَمِّلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Allah Jalla wa Ala has promised those among you who believe in Allah Jalla wa Ala and do righteous deeds. لَيَسْتَخْلِفَنَّهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ كَمَ اسْتَخْلَفَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهُمْ وَلَا يُمَكِّنَنَّ لَهُمْ دِينَهُمْ وَلَا يُبَدِّلَنَّهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ وَلَا يُبَدِّلَنَّهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ خَوْفِهِمْ أَمْنَ upon what يَعْبُدُونَنِي لَا يُشْرِكُونَ بِي شَيْئًا Allah Jalla wa Ala explains to us in this verse how we can gain success, succession and khilafah and authority and power in, in the dunya by doing righteous actions, by believing and doing righteous actions. Allah Jalla wa Ala says يَعْبُدُونَنِي that they worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they do not associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The mafhum of that, the understanding is for as long as we worship other than Allah Jalla wa Ala, and for as long as we commit shirk and we don't worship Allah upon Tawheed, then we won't attain any of the virtues mentioned in this verse. Any of the virtues mentioned in this verse. طيب. And number nine, also Ahlul Sunnah la yarawna taghir hal al Muslimin bil mudaharat wal khuruj wal fawda wa insha al jamaat dawiya wa jihadiya. Ahlul Sunnah wal Jamaa, they don't see that the affair of the Muslims will be rectified. By going out and protesting in, and demonstrating and rebelling against the Muslim rulers and causing chaos and setting up groups or parties and organizations that are under the radar, whether they are hidden or under the radar, and then calling them jama'at jihadiyyah, calling them jama'at that call to the jihad of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are just some of the main traits or foundations that distinguish the manhaj as salafi from all other deviant sects now that you know these usul in nine or whatever else was mentioned in the coming lectures when you're hearing about innovations all you need to do is go back to these foundations what foundation which foundation did they oppose 
And that is how the Muslim learns his aqidah. You first learn the haq, the truth. Once you know the truth, you'll automatically be able to differentiate between the truth and the falsehood. And that is a mistake that is commonly made, especially among Salafis, some Salafis, whereby they take their religion from wudud, from refutations. That is not a sustainable methodology of learning the aqidah of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Because in refutations, things are said that may not necessarily be the mahalul shahid, the point of evidence, like in they are said for to, to get to another meaning. Like in the first thing that the young Muslim, that the Salaf in general, that the Muslim in general has to do is learn the correct aqidah of, of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah. طيب. The last mabhath is some masail that are commonly mentioned with regards to the Salaf methodology. The first is. Is it correct to say that the Salafi manhaj is that which opposes the Mathalan, the Hanbali or the Shafi'i or the Maliki or the Hanafi madhab? Meaning, are they, is it a Qasim or is it things, is it something that is on the opposite side of the spectrum? The answer is no. The Salafi methodology is a Aqidah belief. These four madhabs are a Fiqhi methodology. Fiqhi meaning the branches of the Sharia, Salah, Zakah, Siyam, Fasting, Hajj and so on. So when you say the Salafi methodology, you don't say what contradicts or what is on the opposite side on the same line is what? The four madhabs. La. What is in reality the opposite side is the belief of the Khawarij for example, the Shia, uh, the Ikhwan Muslimin, Jama'at Tabliq the Asha'ira, the Mu'tazila, these sorts of deviant beliefs. So the Salafi methodology contradicts all of these deviant ideologies and beliefs. Like in the, the, these four madhabs, they are madhabs from the belief of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. These are methodologies that are found in Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Likewise, you will find some Asha'ira following the Shafi'i madhab, some Maturudis following the, the Hanafi madhab. That doesn't stand for anything because with regards to Salah and Zakat and so on, the Fuqaha, Rahmatullah alayhim, they differ. The next mas'ala is, which is probably the last mas'ala, with what does a person, or how does a person leave the fold of the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? How does a person leave the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? So the scholars say, Bima yakhruju rajulu min sunnah With that, what, how does he leave the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? With two things, one of two things. First and foremost, if they say or if they contradict a, a foundation from the foundations or a fundamental from the fundamentals of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, that is an amr, that is kulli, a general principle or a general foundation from the foundations of the Sharia. For example, if they agree upon that all of the Sahaba or that the Sahaba are all what? Uh, or that the Sahaba are all innovators Or that they negate the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Or that they believe for example it's permissible to rebel against the, against the hukam Or that they believe that they should not refute Ahlul Bid'ah And it's not desirable to refute the people of desires طيب. So all of these are usul or foundations of the usul of Ahlul Sunnah. And if a person opposes them, then they have taken themselves out of the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after the proof has been established upon them. The next mas'ala is if a person contradicts different juz'iyat, different juz'iyat, different branches or different masail, individual masail, in which the khilaf between Ahlul Sunnah and Ahlul Bid'ah is commonly known. Different masail or individual masail in which the methodology of Ahlul Sunnah clearly differ, differs from the, that of the people of Bid'ah. For example, if a person says, I like all of the Sahaba, lakin uh, Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, he was a, this, he was that. Or all of the Sahaba, all of the Khulafa Rashidun were mashallah, lakin or they were all good and upon the truth Like Uthman ibn Affan was a person of misguidance He used to cheat the people And his 
uh, his legacy was uh, a, 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 a hole in the tarikh or in the history of the Muslims. Or they say it is permissible to rebel against this ruler of the Muslims in any one land, yani this ruler. That's why the Salaf, rahmatullah alayhim, they would say that certain people, Mathalan, Ahmed ibn Salih, or al Hassan ibn Salih, I believe it was, they would say, that Imam Ahmed and Sufyan Thug, they would say he was a Mubtadi'. The reason they would mention is, Kana Yara Saif. He used to see that it was permissible to rebel against the Hukam, although he's never actually rebelled against the Hukam. Although he's never rebelled against the Hukam. That's why I believe it was Sufyan al that saw him one time, he was emotional, he was crying. He said, Don't believe in these, these hypocrites' tears. Which shows how stern Ahl Sunnah were against the people of the Bid'ah. So the person leaves the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, with these Masail. For example, uh, Allah Jalla wa Ala, Istiwa, Istiwa is known yani, among Ahl Sunnah. Oh, Rahman, Allah Jalla wa Ala rose above his throne. Ahl Bid'ah, they say, La Istola. Or they say, for example, we don't believe in the hadith where, the Prophet, where Allah Jalla wa Ala, where Allah Jalla wa Ala descends to the lowest heaven every night. We don't believe in that hadith. And they mention different doubts. The person will leave the method, the aqeed of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah because of this. Also, it's important to know that the person that takes people out of the Sunnah, or the person himself, he takes himself out of the Sunnah, like in the people that clarify this and establish the proof are the scholars of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Hence, the Shabab, those seeking knowledge, uh, they should not busy themselves with he's a Muqtada and he's a Sunni or he's this, he's that. These are left to those people that are qualified because they are the ones that know what takes a person out of the Sunnah. So with regards to that issue, we can't be on either of the two extremes as we shall see. We can't say, La, no one can be a Muqtada. Muqtada is only something that was found about a thousand years ago and there's no Muqtada today as long as everyone's upon good and khayyag, alhamdulillah, we get along like a house on fire. We can't say that. And you can't also say the opposite, which is to say that everyone doesn't agree with me, who doesn't agree with me is a mubtadi'. He's not in the masjid today, therefore he must be a mubtadi'. He hasn't come to this conference or he doesn't come to this city or this... When he comes to this area, he doesn't come to masjid in nowhere, we say he must be a mubtadi'. No, we can't say that, so we need to be balanced. So that is uh, a, uh, a summary of the first lecture. We'll carry on with Shaykh Muhammad in the, in the next lecture, inshallah, in about five or... 10 minutes or so inshallah wallahu ta'ala a'lam wa ahkamu billahi tawfiq